Okay, so let's start. I've got three of you um, on the session today, just uh, making a quick summary in terms of, you know, um, for, for my own understanding. Um, I've got Toby, um, I've got Arsalan, and I've got Boshirat. So just to check with all of you in terms of one by one very quickly, uh, Toby, you've done two units, isn't it? Yeah, I've done two units. So you've done the academic research skills and the communication skills. Yeah, sure. Okay, and then Arslan, you've done the same units? Yes, sir. Okay, and Bushirat, you've also done the same units? Yes, sir. Okay, that's brilliant. So we've got this just as a summary so that, you know, what we'll do is you, you have received the session invites now for both the other two units that you're looking at completing with me. One is the health and social care sector that you see on your screen. And the other one is primarily the person-centered approach, which we are going to do after this unit. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay, good start. To find out from them who were, how do we approach? So then we've done all the assessment, and this is what we are doing to them. Right. So what we are going to do in today's session is obviously look at a bit of a unit introduction uh, for health and social care sector. And then what we're going to do is get into understanding the first learning outcome. Now, this unit we are looking at covering in about four sessions, three sessions primarily to look at you know, uh, coverage of uh, the uh, learning outcomes. Uh, today, we are going to look at learning outcome one and all the assessment criteria. I think tomorrow it's going to be learning outcome two. Next week, Monday, there is no session because Monday is a bank holiday. So Tuesday, we'll be looking at covering learning outcome three. And then following week, we'll be looking at assignment discussion and then start with person-centered approach on Tuesday. So the uh, classes on this, if I... Um, uh, look at would be Monday, Tuesday, because of the fact that we have bank holidays in some of the, uh, you know, weeks which are coming through. That's why these class will essentially be moving to, you know, Tuesday on some days. But the idea here is to try and look at completing both these units within this month, um, uh, before the end of this month. So there are about six or seven sessions which are required to be done. And what we'll do is cover those across uh, you know, as we go along and study these units. Now, health and social care sector, very important unit. One of the core units that you're going to study uh, in this particular, um, let's put it this way, um, uh, you know, this particular qualification, which is level three diploma in health and social care. And the reason I say that is because this unit is all about understanding how the health and social care sector works within the UK. And the main part of this is the backbone of, uh, you know, how health and social care services, primary care, secondary care, social care, public health, mental health services, and any, any other allied healthcare services are provided and delivered through the National Health Service in the UK. So it is a unit which will be quite interesting to study because of the fact that you will gain a lot of knowledge, understand a lot of things about, uh, you know, the Department of Health in the UK, you're also going to be looking at some of the key acts and legislations that we need to be aware of. And then overall, what we're going to be seeing is the working of a lot of agencies, which essentially work with the National Health Service. So National Health Service is not alone. National Health Service, along with a lot of different, uh, you know, regulators and watchdogs essentially looks at providing these services to the members of public in the UK. And these services typically, you know, encompass services, including things like um, you know, if I put it this way, things like, you know, primary care, secondary care, primary care is when you are looking at, you know, I will go into detail, but primary, secondary care, social care, and obviously anything to do with mental health care as well, which is now uh, part and parcel of the National Health Service and its forte. Now, what we are going to look at in the first learning outcome in particular is going to be discussing about, um, you know, things which are related to, you um, overall structure 
of how the public health services and services within the UK in particular is are provided to the members of public. There are devolved nations, obviously, in the UK. So yeah, United Kingdom is a combination of four devolved nations, England, Wales, United um, England and Wales. Then you have Northern Ireland and Scotland. So they make up the four nations in the United Kingdom. So obviously, the structure of providing uh, the health and social care services in the UK is devolved and each of these governments have the ability to be able to take, make decisions in terms of how these services are provided to the members of public. Now, pretty much the structure of how they, let's put it this way, the structure of how these services are provided to the members of public in the UK pretty much remains the same. Although there are regional variations, we are going to be focused on studying how the NHS provides uh, or the health and social care sector and underneath that Department of Health and then underneath that the National Health Service provides most of these services to members of public in England and Wales. Now there are certain variations, those of you who are interested in studying those variations across Northern Ireland, which has a population of 1.6 million and Scotland about 6 million, um, there are documents which are going to be made available on mobile and that could be for additional reading that you would want to do so should you want to understand and develop a bit more understanding into how the structure and the organization is structured in terms of uh, the devolved nations in particular. Now, the learning, this unit, if I look at uh, very briefly the unit aim, this unit is focused on you know, uh, helping you understand the structure of how health and social care sector um, uh, you know, works in the UK and what are the various pieces of legislation, which is acts that we study, the Health and Social Care Act, the Mental Health Act. You know, we look at lots of different acts which are there, the NHS Act of 2010. Um, we would want to understand the key legislations which are responsible for the creation of policies and procedures, which all the different agencies, uh, regulators, and also different setups essentially help follow and then provide these services to the members of public. So when I look at CQC, one of the regulators, when I look at NICE, National Institute of Care and Health, Healthcare Excellence, when we look at uh, you know some of the signature bodies like MHRA, these bodies are bodies which basically follow these legislations. They basically interpret these legislations into what are called guidelines. And those are then uh, you know, formed as uh, or are circulated as policies, procedures and guidelines, which most of the agencies, uh, organizations typically follow in delivering these services to the members of public. Now, there are um, four assessment criteria, um, five assessment criteria in learning outcome one. So the first one will be structure. The second is the role, on, role of watchdogs and regulators. We'll talk about a number of watchdogs and bodies which are prevalent in the health and social care sector. And we look at their roles and responsibilities briefly. Then the third part talks about explaining the roles and responsibilities of you know, a set of practitioners, but within a particular uh, setup. So I can't say national health service, it's a very big setup. I can look at a care home, I can look at say a community center, a pharmacy, a GP surgery, but I will need to look at taking a named organization. That means an organization which works within the health and social care sector under the Department of Health, under the structure which is created by the national health service. And we'll have to take one small body to be able to discuss about what is the structure and how the structure helps in delivery of these services. So structure would mean what are the practitioners who are involved. So when I look at a surgery, we have GPs, we have people, GPs on locum, we have receptionists, we have clinical nurses, we have administrators, we have a practice manager. So that would form the structure of the organization. Now the <clears throat> merit and distinction criteria are looking into understanding why is career professional development an important part or an integral part within the health and social care sector. So why do we need to have training and development? Why do we need to have a structured a plan to be able to develop our skills, knowledge, and keep them up to date when we look at working within the sector, or when we look at providing services within the sector? So we look at a template of CPD, which is career professional development template. And then we will also look at understanding what are the various ways in which we can look at 
creating or studying a structure of the organization, uh, which is again a named organization, and that would help us in basically, uh, you know, covering the distinction criteria. Now, in order to study this particular learning outcome, we've got learning outcome two is a bit smaller. Learning outcome three is also as massive as learning outcome one. So the lecture is going to be about 40, 45 minutes. And I've got a PowerPoint presentation, which I'm going to take you through. This presentation is available on Moodle. Now, this presentation discusses some of the requirements of uh, and the assessment criteria that we need to be looking at covering within this particular uh, unit. So we'll start off with the structure, you know, of, uh, you know, the overall structure of health and social care sector. Now, if we look at this particular chart, you know, if I just magnify this slightly, and I look at this particular chart of department of, uh, you know, health, and this structure, as I mentioned to you, is when we are looking at studying, we are going to be looking at studying, you know, the structure within England and Wales. Now, if I look at this particular chart, this particular chart explains how these services are structured. That means they're organized within England and Wales. So if I look at uh, the basic of very, uh, you know, services and how they are available to you as members of public, a simple example that I would take here is if I look at, say, for example, I have a problem, um, say, for example, I've been having stomach ache for a number of days, and I now need to speak to a doctor in my GP surgery where I'm registered. Now, how would the uh, setup actually provide me this particular service in terms of medication or a prescription, and then help me look at diagnose my problem, and then provide suitable prescription, which I'll, you know, obviously collect from the reception, then I'll give it to the pharmacy, pharmacy provides medication, and hopefully I'll get better soon. Now, when you look at this organization of how the flow of uh, you know, things happen in terms of actions or in terms of various uh, process that you follow through to be able to get through your GP, then collect a prescription, go to the pharmacy, get the prescription, take the medication and then get well soon is the structure that we're going to be talking about. So when we look at the health and social care sector in England and Wales and in, in the UK, it, it is a system of complex and diverse, you know, range of services which are provided and these range of services are provided by different organizations and professionals working within the organization. So when I say organization, what I mean by that is I needed to get help from uh, my doctor, but what is the organization involved? It is the surgery. Now, when I look at the doctor looking at me and we look at the nurse obviously looking at me, or if I book uh, an appointment with the doctor, I go through a, a phone booking appointment system, or a walk-in surgery, I need to speak to the receptionist or the practice manager. That person is also involved in, in some way or the other in me helping to get an appointment. At some stage, when the doctor prints the prescription, I then give it to the pharmacy and the pharmacist in the pharmacy then prepares the prescription and gives it to me, again, is a professional. And that, or he or she is actually working within the pharmacy setup, which could be attached to the GP surgery, or it could be a separate organization which is running as a pharmacy in the in the high street and in, in, in the high street and that is where you go and give your prescription and then you are able to collect that prescription and the medication on the basis of that prescription to get better now if you see it is a complex set of system which encompasses range of services some of them are only giving you administration services the receptionist the practice manager the booking of appointment some of them are giving you specialist service when you speak to the gp or the clinical nurse some of them uh, pharmacist when he or she prepares the medication and they are all working in different organizations. So when I look at different departments, different organization, organization might be two, GP surgery and pharmacy. But if you look at breaking it down further into a structure, the administration team would be working in the operation side of things. The GP would be working in the medical side of things. The practice manager would be working more or less in the uh, operational side of things in the surgery. And then you look at the pharmacy wherein the pharmacist and the uh, relevant staff prepares the prescription uh, medication against as per the prescription is actually working in a different setup of an organization which is termed as pharmacy so here the overall structure of department uh, you know health and social care is under the department of health and under the department of health you have nhs england you have nhs england quality care commission which sits as an independent adjudicator and monitors the delivery of these services by creating processes and guidelines. So it's an independent regulator. That's why it's highlighted in green. 
And then you have the NHS Improvement Board, the board which is responsible for the NHS Act. And this particular body looks at overall uh, functioning of the system under the Department of Health. So they are the ones which are responsible for creating new policies. They are the ones which are responsible for creating procedures, guidelines, and they are the ones which create white papers, which then are debated in parliament. And if there are changes required to be done in law, then they go through the route of legislation. Legislation then gets passed by the parliament. It becomes an act. And that act is then used to create policies and guidelines, which are then provided to other organizations or other multi, uh, let's say, disciplinary organizations, which are essentially working with the NHS to provide primary, secondary, uh, social care, mental health care, public health services to the members of public. Now, under the NHS England, you have um, you know sustainability and transformation partnerships, which is a body which primarily looks at um, you know. Okay, let's look at the bodies first. So you have the clinical commissioning groups, you have the um, health and wellbeing board, you have uh, essentially health watch. You have GP surgeries, you have hospitals, you have private uh, care providers like Bupa, you have Spiral, lots of other private hospitals or providers, and then you have social care providers. So when you look at these bodies, they all help in the, uh, what do you call, uh, functioning and working off and providing these bodies then work together. As you can see, a lot of arrows crisscross going across the structure, which shows that these organizations depend on each other, work together in tandem to be able to provide these services to the members of public. Now, what is the reason of these coloring? Green is the national uh, side of things. So everything in terms of policy, decision making nationally done by the government, the purple blocks are basically local or regional variations of how these groups essentially help in uh, you know, then working and providing these services. And then when we look at blue arrows, they are support or uh, support arrows or arrows with, wherein the organizations support each other. The orange ones are the ones which primarily are responsible for delivery of care to the user, to the end user. So when you go to the GP surgery, you're going to the last mile wherein the GP surgery or people working within the GP surgery will provide the service to you directly. When you look at the a &E service, hospitals, they are the ones which provide this service. Background and most of the structure here tends to be what is called the administration or background structure. Now, some of these, for example, when we look at the sustainability and transformation partnership, these are organizations which are basically working in collaboration with the National Health Service, local councils or council bodies in, in, in England, and their aim is to primarily look at improving health and care services in the local area. So when I look at Manchester area, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority or the local council, Stratford Council, you know, uh, you look at, say, for example, Berry Council, Bolt Council, Wigan Council, they are all essentially local councils which will work with the setup under the NHS England to be able to draw up a five-year plan. And these five-year plans would be looking at primarily improving the quality and delivery of services to people or local populations in that area. So the STP, STP in short, are basically organizations which encourage, uh, you know, and look at working together with a lot of other different uh, bodies to be able to look at reducing any sort of healthcare inequalities or essentially ensuring that the local authorities are adequately stocked with, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say, facilities or have adequate uh, will, uh, stocks of facilities to be able to provide these service to the local population. Now, this structure is a generic overall overview of the structure of, you know, how health and social care services are provided in England. Now, if I look at this particular chart, which is the pie chart, here, this pie chart basically looks at, you know, last updated in April 2013. But this pie chart basically shows how the Department of Health and, you know, various bodies, uh, you know, look at providing finally primary care, secondary care, social care, mental health care, or any sort of care services to the uh, populations. And what this has done is it's shown in a way how the circle, um, you know, how the policy side of things in the outside, the departments, and then slowly and gradually, the nitty gritty of the services which are provided to people in communities is done by, you know, these four bodies, which are GP surgeries, A&E, hospitals, 
your private providers, sometimes NHS would refer, if there are long waiting lists, the NHS would refer, you know, patients to go and get operations done or, you know, procedures done through a private hospital where the NHS would pay for it. And then when you receive care in the community, say, for example, you've had an accident and you're recovering, but there are people who would come in and, you know, help you like physiotherapists, or uh, if you need any sort of, uh, you know, therapy, then in those cases, the members of community related services or communities, local authorities would work with social service and social care workers to be able to provide these services to you. And they would come across, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, local authorities and the social care provider. So this tends to be the overall structure of the, uh, you know, health and social care sector within the UK. And in particular, when we look at England. Now, when we look at understanding, uh, you know, the Department of Health, uh, one of the clear things that I would want to look at is you might have to do a bit of research. Obviously, I can't go into a lot of details. And this is knowledge that I've gathered, obviously, over the years as I've been teaching this particular unit. You would look at Department of Health. You know, you could you could read about Department of Health. Uh, you know, on Wikipedia or do a quick search on the NHS website and there will be something which will come up and you'll probably look at a 10 minute reading and that will give you a lot of insight into the Department of Health. Now, what is DOH? DOH or Department of Health, in short, D-O-H, Department of Health. Now, Department of Health, in short, plays a very crucial role in obviously looking at creating you know, the health and social care system, that is what we are very proud of when we talk about the National Health Service. Now, National Health Service and the Department of Health, you know, are basically organizations which set the policy and strategic direction of how health and social care services are provided to members of public in the UK. Now, it could involve Department of Health. Who's the health secretary right now? Any idea? Who's the health secretary in the UK right now? General knowledge question. Any idea? Okay, if you do a quick going, Googling up, you know, I think the health secretary currently, um, you know, I think I'm not too sure who, um, let me check who is the last I know was Matt Hancock. And after that, we had the current chancellor, which is, uh, you know, yes, yes. Yeah, sorry, who is it? Steve. Steve L. Barclay. Oh, yeah, Steve Barclay, that's correct. Yeah, he's the one who's been now given the charge. So there are lots of, uh, you know, health secretaries that we've seen a transition under the Tories. So I, I've lost track of it. So we had Matt Hallgate uh, uh, or Matt Hancock, sorry. Then at some point in time, you had uh, Sajid Javed. Then you had, uh, you know, Jeremy Hunt, who's now the current chancellor. And then after that, it's now gone to Steve Barclay. So he's the current health secretary. Now, the role of the Department of Health is to look at working with key stakeholders. And when they work with key stakeholders, they include people from the community, patient, uh, you know, care. They include people from the NHS, various regional boards, local authorities, and uh, the National Health Service and the NHS Constitution and the NHS Improvement Trust. And they look at setting the strategic direction of where the health and social care services are moving in the country. Now, they are involved in developing and implementing national policies. They create frameworks. They look at also mentioning or creating guidelines, which are then followed by regulators and most of the other agencies which work within this sector and provide services to, in one way or the other, to the members of public. So Department of Health is also the body which basically provides the funding. So when we look at the NHS budget and we talk about NHS budget, what we are essentially talking about is the DOH budget. Now, the National Health Service provides all types of services, whether it's primary care, secondary care, mental health care, social care. Now, obviously, the Tory government has initiated something wherein they are setting apart separate budgets for mental health care and social health care, social health care system. But essentially, all of it is funded by the Department of Health. So they are they're one of the key roles that you will see is DOH's role is to ensure that there is adequate funding available and there is enough resources, there are enough and adequate resources available for the commissioning of health and social care services to be provided to the members of public. Now, this could be done through public providers, public-private partnerships. It could be through third sector uh, you know, organizations or uh, private organizations 
working in this sector, but their role is to ensure that, you know, uh, funding is available and there are adequate resources in terms of administrative, financial, manpower, and, you know, various, various organizations available to be able to deliver these services to the members of public. Now, Let's look at one of the key acts that that is very, very important for us to understand. When we talk about this key act of, uh, you know, Health and Social Care Act of 2012, this particular act actually gives an uh, overall layout of how the Department of Health actually structures these services for delivery uh, to the members of public. So when we talk about this piece of, uh, you know, this particular act, this is an important piece of legislation because it was introduced in 2012. And when this was introduced, the main aim of the act was to promote greater inter integration and coordination of health and social care services amongst all the various providers and departments which are involved in delivery of these service to the uh, members of public. So I can't say the GP surgeries, you know, work in isolation with pharmacies or pharmacies work in isolation with hospitals and things like that. So the idea was to try and create a connect between all these organizations. And that was the clear aim of, you know, bringing this act, uh, you know, uh, by the government in 2012. Now, this act led to the creation of a lot of different types of groups. One of them is called the CCGs, the clinical commissioning groups. Now the CCGs are the group of is a group which basically consists of doctors. It consists of you know other healthcare professionals like nurses, occupational therapists, you know all the other people who work within this sector, and they are the ones which are primarily responsible for providing and delivering healthcare services. So who would give me an injection if I needed to get one during the COVID jab? It was a trained nurse or a trained healthcare professional who was giving me the job. So CCG is an important part of, uh, you know, the uh, Health and Social Care Act. So one of the key groups within this act, which works with some of the other groups to ensure that services are delivered, are basically CCGs. Then we look at the health and well-being boards. We look at, uh, you know, PCTs, which are primary care trusts which own the hospitals, which own the a &E services. And obviously, if I look at Manchester, the Greater Manchester Infirmary and the Vidinch Hospital is under one trust. You look at uh, the Northern uh, Hospital and the Bolton Hospital, they are under one trust. So they are different trusts which basically, you know, are responsible under the CCGs to be able to provide um, these frontline services to the members of public. And then we have the NHS Commissioning Board. So when we talk about the NHS Commissioning Board, you know, in this particular chart, you look at the NHS improvement of the Commissioning Board. This board is responsible for overseeing the work of CCGs and, you know, PCTs. So they are responsible for ensuring that, you know, any clinical commissioning group, which is the ones which is forming form, formed of doctors and professionals, and, you know, the PCTs, which is primary care tasks, they are essentially monitored to ensure that they are delivering on the targets which are set or delivering on the guidelines and following the guidelines to be able to provide these services. Then we see the role of the regulator called CQC. Now CQC is, um, you know, is quality, Care Quality Commission, and this is responsible for regulating, inspecting health and social care providers in England. So their aim is to ensure that the quality of service and quality of care is provided and is ensuring that patients receive safe, effective, and integrated care wherever they are receiving it for whatever reasons they are receiving it. So if you are in residential care or if you are in a hospital, if you are in an a &E, or if you are going to a surgery, all these places where you get service in terms of care, whether it's clinical care, primary care, secondary care, you know, social care, health care, health care, whatever it is, mental health care, you are going to get it as per certain conformance and guidelines which are set by the regulator, which is CQC. So overall, if I look at, you know, the structure of uh, why this act was introduced was that we wanted to make sure that public health, NHS and adult social care and all the bodies which are working in between are able to talk to each other and are able to ensure that there is, uh, you know, a, a, let's say uh, agreement on how the services are to be delivered. They are looking at, uh, you know, delivering services which are quality driven. They are making sure that these services are accessible. 
Like if you live in a, uh, if you live outside town and you do not have access to any or an ambulance and, uh, you know, accident and ambulance services, any services, then this is something which the local authorities need to look at. And there should be a provision wherein you are able to access some of these services, even if you live within as a remote community or as, if, you, if you live in remote locations within the country. So accessibility is important. And that is why the Health and Social Care Act ensures that if all these organizations are working within the sector, they are ensuring that they are able to provide the services to all members of public wherever they are in the country. And it is also ensuring that the efficiency of these services, that means the public money, taxpayers' money, is being put to good use as far as the services being provided are, are concerned. So this act actually acts as a binding glue, if I put it this way, which brings national and local, um, you know, all the departments under public health, NHS, National Health Service, and the adult social care, all into the purview of working together to be able to synchronously deliver services to or provide services to members of public. Is that okay? So what we've done is we've drilled down from the overall structure into understanding what keeps this structure together, what are the various components in this structure, and how these components are important in terms of providing delivery in terms of health and social care services to the members of public. Any questions on this so far? Okay. So let's, you can ask me questions through the chat route as well, not a problem. Now, the second assessment criteria that we are looking at is explain the role of health and social care regulators. Now, what is regulation and why do we need regulators in health and social care? So if you look at generically speaking first, what is regulation? Regulation plays a major role in the health and social care industry because what we are looking at is we are dealing with people's life. We are dealing with, you know, uh, uh, situations in which, you know, if there are, um, let's say, um, um, you know, if there are, if these services are not delivered to a certain level, then it can lead to loss of life. So regulation looks at ensuring that there is compliance, follow up of the guidelines which are laid out and ensures that people and, you know, people, equipment, resources are adequately geared enough to be able to provide these services to the members of public. So here the regulation and the regulatory bodies look at mitigating or minimizing any risks which the members of public might have and their responsibility is to ensure that they need to introduce or have guidelines, procedures, policies in place, which when adhered to, which when followed, lead to, you know, uh, let's say predicted outcomes. They don't lead to, uh, you know, loss of life or death. They lead to predicted outcomes. Now, there are lots of different organizations within this sector uh, which basically act as a regulator. But one, one of the key ones that we need to be aware of is CQC. Uh, the Care Quality Commission was established in 2009. And when we look at the CQC or uh, Care Quality Commission in general, the Care Quality Commission essentially is the body which regulates, inspects, monitors, and also comes out with you know, guidelines which are to be followed by you know all the uh, providers or uh, you know service providers within this particular sector so cqc's main role is to ensure that health and social care services provided to the people are safe they are effective people who are providing these services are compassionate and they are driven to provide high quality care and this ensures that the people receiving care are able to get better get well soon and ensures that you know services which are being delivered through hospitals, care homes, dental practices, care agencies, or any such particular setup conforms to the guidelines which have been set uh, under the various acts responsible for running the operations or you know providing these services within these setups. Now, there are lots of other health and social care regulators. Now, there are, as you understand, different bodies. So if I look at, uh, you know, the um, various bodies which are primarily also helping to set regulation or guidelines which can be, which should be followed to be able to provide, you know, care and ensure patient safety, uh, you know, there are lots of these bodies. So these bodies include, for example, GMC, which is what we are aware of. GMC regulates doctors, you know, general medical counsel. We are aware of the nursing 
because of the nursing strike happening, we are aware of the Nursing and Mid Midwifery Council, the NMC, and we get to see pretty much everyone, somebody talking, uh, you know, to the news presenters nowadays to say why the nurses are going on strike, things like that. So these are important bodies which are essentially, you know, uh, regulating the people working within a particular sector. So when we look at nurses, the Royal Medical Nurses uh, Council or the NMC essentially regulates nurses, midwives, and also specialist community of public health care services, uh, you know, nurses which provide uh, triage, for example, nurses which go and do visits to home, uh, you know, and look at uh, providing uh, care and uh, monitoring uh, patients after, say, for example, maternity, uh, if you've had a delivery or you, you've undergone a, uh, you know, you, you've delivered a baby, then obviously after primary care is provided in the hospital, you get discharged, you go to your home, and then there is a team of nurses which basically visits you regularly to ensure that you are uh, recovering the child as well, the mother as well, and they would be a part of, you know, community-based uh, nurses or services which are provided. Healthcare professionals, HCPC is a signature body which regulates these many different types of people, uh, you know, which work within the uh, sector. So some of you, if you had an X-ray scan or an MRI scan or a CT scan, you know, at some stage you would have dealt or been in touch with people who are radiographers, essentially people who operate some of these machines. They are specialists. They have specialist training on it. And they are the ones which are regulated through the healthcare professional council. So there are lots of these different 18 or 19 regulators. You have them for pharmaceutical pharmacies, essentially pharmaceutical companies. And these regulators together with CQC essentially lay down guidelines in their respective sector and then ensure that services being provided to patients are safe. They are uh, you know, monitored for clinical effectiveness and they are ensuring that people who are receiving these services are able to access them freely. Uh, there is, uh, you know, these services also need to be accessible. That means, you know, having the service is one thing, but they need to be also accessible. That means you should be able to easily uh, ask for these services as and when required. And these services which are being provided are conforming to certain levels of quality of care. And that is ensured through uh, by the central regulator, which is Care Quality Commission. Now, there are different slides and obviously in some of these slides, what I've done is I've looked at some of the important, you know, commissions and their key roles that you would see, uh, which are required to be understood when we talk about regulation and monitoring, you know, of um, regulation and monitoring of, you know, um, the, let's put it this way, regulators and monitoring, which is done by some of these regulators within the health and social care sector. So we look at you know, the National Quality Board, the CQC, the General Medical Council, you look at the Health Watch, the Nurses and Midwifery Council, you have General Dental Council, Pharmaceutical, you know, GMC and all those. And they are a few that I've taken here primarily to give you a snapshot of what is the role of health and social care regulators and watchdogs within this particular sector. So you need to be able to understand a few of them, have details about a few of them, and should be able to, you know, explain the role they carry out within uh, this particular sector when we talk about, uh, you know, their role as a regulator and as a watchdog. Is that okay? Any questions on this so far? Okay. The next assessment criteria that we go to is looking at in detail about the roles and responsibilities of staff that work within a particular regulator or a particular provider. So there are roles and responsibilities that we can cover, you know, for people who work within different sets of organizations within the health and social care sector. And they could be people who work in social services, they work as healthcare visitors, GPs, people who work within the police, school, psychology. You know, when we look at dinner ladies in the school or if we look at a nurse which is based in uh, based in the school providing services uh, or medical services to you know children if they get injured or if they need medication then we are looking at a lot of different types of roles which people can take up within this particular sector now what we need to be able to do is understand and explain some of the key roles which some of these people do if they work within that particular uh, you know role 
So when we look at social services, what do social services do? Social services look after and provide support to people or children in particular, which are considered vulnerable. So their role is to work as a conduit or as a link between local authorities and agencies which are providing this care directly to the child or uh, person who is vulnerable. And their aim is to ensure safeguarding. Their aim is to ensure that people in this particular uh, who are receiving, who are vulnerable, have disabilities and cannot, uh, say, for example, perform some of the essential functions on their own. And that is where the social care services come in or step in to help and support these functions. Their role is to ensure that these people are kept out of the harm's way. They are not essentially abused. They are not neglected. They are not exploited. And when I say abuse, I mean abuse could be of different types, physical abuse, sexual abuse, you know, financial abuse. It could be verbal abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse. There are 10 different types of abuses. So essentially, social care services role is to prevent any sort of abuse which could be vetted out to these people who are considered vulnerable in this society. And they are people who require support or services from the health and social care, from within the health and social care services of the social care workers, healthcare visitors to be able to provide and, uh, you know, uh, let's say to be able to receive these services to help them do their daily course and then help them live independently as much as possible. And that is what we need to look at for some of the roles that you can think of of people who work within this particular sector. Other, we could look at nurses, for example, we look at healthcare assistant. I have only looked at maybe a few here. I could add, for example, healthcare assistant, or in general, say healthcare workers. I could write uh, nurses. We could all, we could think of any role that you feel is sub, uh, when we look at a broad chart, there are different types of roles which you know you can look at within this sector uh, which primarily you know this is a chart that i've taken uh, you know from an ncfe website and this basically highlights all the different roles that actually people can do within the health and social care sector so if i look at showing you the link in terms of what are the various roles that uh, you know people can do uh, within uh, the health and social care sector, what I want to do is I need to put this across here so that you are able to go in and obviously explore some of these roles. And I'll briefly show you this link right now. The reason is this is a good uh, site to be able to go in and do a bit of, um, let's say, um, you know, test yourself to see what kind of roles are suitable for you. There are over 350 different types of uh, roles that you can do within the national health service or in general within the health and social care sector. So if I look at you want to become a health professional, what is the role of health professional? What is an overview? You click on it and it'll tell you within the healthcare professional role, there are 15 different types of role available and it will talk you through each of these different roles. And then towards the end, it will also show you or ask you to look at uh, taking a quiz. And that quiz is essentially going to be useful for you because it will uh, allow you to undergo a quick multiple choice question test and then tell you which is the most ideal career or option for you if you want to work within the health and social care sector. Mm -hmm. So here is where it says, not sure where to start, click on find your career options. And when you click on this particular link, it will ask you to get started. It will take about five to seven minutes for you to complete this questionnaire, depending on there are no right and wrong answers. But when you complete this particular questionnaire and what are you looking at doing, it will suggest you what kind of roles can you apply for within the National Health Service or what kind of a career can you take up within the National Health Service. And this is going to be very, very useful. So if I look at putting these two links here, um, you know, that would help you also cover this particular uh, you know, assessment criteria. So what we need to be able to do is look at finding out, do this quiz, find out what kind of uh, qualities you have, what skills you have, what are you wor working towards in terms of studying, where you want to reach. And then towards the end, it will suggest you some career roles. And those roles will also have roles and responsibilities mentioned 
uh, you know, towards the end, and they can be then utilized for you to complete this assessment criteria, which is learning uh, assessment criteria 1.3. So I put this link here for you in this case, and this should allow you to study this in a bit more detail. Any questions on this so far? Any questions? Okay, so let's look at the merit assessment criteria. Now, one of the key things that we need to note and understand in this particular sector is that there is a lot of focus on training and development, professional training and development. The reason why do we need to look at professional training and uh, development is because this is a process which basically helps us maintain, enhance our knowledge, our skills, and the abilities that are required for us to function effectively within a particular role that has been assigned to us or within a particular job role that I've taken to work within this sector. So CPD, in short, career professional development or continuous professional development is very essential because it is also related to your progression, your career progression. That is why it is also called CPD, career professional development, because you start off as a healthcare worker you want to, after a couple of years, when you've gained a lot of knowledge and skills in that profession, you want to rise to the next level. Then you want to work in a couple of years, then again, go to the next level, then go to the next level. So career planning is also very important. And that is why CPD ensures that one, you remain up to date with the developments which are happening in your, in your area, in your field. You are able to adapt and pick up some of the best practices in your area. And then with these skills, knowledge and best practices that you've got, you're able to then choose the right career pathways, which are going to help you, uh, you know, uh, go into a particular role that you would want to do uh, and, you know, uh, take up or want to do or take up in, in the future. And that is why CPD is very important. Now, when we look at CPD, you know, there is um, CPD in any case is something which is, um, you know, actually written in the NHS constitution. So one of the key things which the National Health Service prescribes is that every employee, every staff working within the sector should have a CPD. That means they should have a documented continuous professional development plan. And this plan is reviewed at the end of every year when your annual appraisals happen. They, this plan helps identify what are the drawbacks? What are the gap areas? What are the areas in which you need training and development? And your managers or your departmental health is then required to put those trainings into place so that you're able to effectively work in your role. Now, the reason is that NHS is also committed to, the National Health Service is also committed to investing in its employees. Whether you're working part-time, full-time, or you're working as a temporary staff or a worker within the organization for a certain weeks, months, hours, whatever it is. Now, it is also important that yes. mandate all nurses and midwives, say, for example, just as one of the bits which I have to be picked up as an example, are need to have, they need to have at least a 35 hours, you know, uh, minimum CPD, which is to be done uh, every year in order to maintain their status as an active, uh, you know, say, for example, um, to be able to have an active license you know, or have an active status of working as a nurse. Now, if you don't maintain those number of hours, then obviously it is going to be difficult for you to maintain your status as a nurse. And these are some of the mandatory requirements which have been put in place to ensure that continuous professional development is done and is, uh, you know, uh, also provided by your employer so that you are able to, you know, grow in your career as you work within this particular sector. Now, there are lots of ways through which we can actually do career professional development. Lots of ways that we can use, uh, you know, career professional development. Now, what are these ways? Sometimes your employer would recommend e-training. They will have, there will be portals or, uh, you know, uh, you know, websites through which employers would deliver these trainings. You have a login and you're able to log into these sites and they would allow you to, uh, you know, continuously train yourself on certain things which are, say, for example, update in terms of trainings or updates in terms of, you know, um, let's take an example. One of the important things what tends to happen is that if a new machinery or an equipment is introduced, 
then all the staff which is required to operate that machinery, say, for example, a new X-ray machine or a blood testing, uh, you know, uh, blood pressure monitor is being introduced and it is replacing an old equipment. Now, it is the mandatory requirement of the employer, in this case, the National Health Service or the hospital or the surgery, to be able to ensure that all staff related to using that equipment are adequately trained as far as the, uh, you know, the use of that machine is concerned or equipment is concerned. Now, if you are not trained on how to use the machine, how to read the signs or how to operate it, then obviously it would mean that either you produce faulty readings or in some cases, you know, that equipment might not help you pick up the vital signs which are required when it is being used. So in terms of training and in terms of ensuring that you are able to understand and use that equipment, uh, you know, to the best of your capability and the capa capacity required to get results, training and development programs are done. And in this case, it will be a training on the new machine or equipment which has been introduced. Sometimes you would see that appraisal systems, reviews, feedback mechanisms are also used to be able to, you know, get feedback from members of staff to be able to implement new policies or, you know, change policies within the organization. Then you are aware of that sometimes you are asked to attend conferences, seminars. You're also asked to earn, uh, attend, say, for example, trainings which are carried out by colleagues. For example, if somebody in the organization in my, uh, you know, organization is responsible for health and safety, he's a fire marshal or a first aider, most of these staff need to do training once a year to keep themselves up to date in terms of understanding regulation. How and if an incident happens in the college and somebody gets injured or needs treatment in terms of first aid, then how do we report this? How do we um, mention this in the incident logbook? These are bits of training which one person would primarily attend every year. And then when the person comes back, they do in-house trainings to be able to train some of the other staff within the organization who would be responsible for providing or acting as the first point of contact if there was an incident to happen, how to pro provide CPR or how to ring up emergency services to be able to get people on board um, would be the training the person would be required to do once a year to maintain the certification and to maintain the skills. And they might also do in-house trainings or informal trainings internally to the members of staff when they have learned uh, these from an external organization or by attending a conference or a or a specific training seminar. Is that okay? So this assessment criteria talks about what is CPD, the importance of CPD, and how is the concept of continuous professional development related to the health and social care sector? Is that okay? Any questions on this so far? Yes, please. Go on. Sorry. What units are we treating, please? Ugh. Health and social care sector. It's... So today we have started a new unit, which is health and social care sector. Is what, what unit is that, please? Unit one, health and social care sector. Is structure or an overview of health care. That is sector. learning outcome one, but the unit that we have started today is health and social care sector. The one that I have is structure and overview of the health care, health and social care sector. We'll, we'll get into this Bukola separately because I don't want to have a question which is probably not related to what you've joined the session for. Maybe because I don't know, because I don't understand what you are saying all along. That's fine. Okay. We will we will have a discussion after the session. Because you, you don't send us any 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 information regarding this um, topic today that we are going to have it. So how so did you join the session then? Sorry? How did you join the session then? I just saw it on the group. So if you're in that group, you are uh, then, uh, you know, you're also getting the announcements which are being put in the group, isn't it? I don't know. Sorry, Pekola, check your email. They send it to everybody's email. I can't find it. They didn't send it to me. All right. No. Okay. So Pekola, what you need to be able to do is obviously, you know, speak to somebody in, um, you know, in the college. I would say speak to Jill. She's the course coordinator. Right. And if you send her an email, she has sent this schedule 
for the two units, you know, that we are starting today. Um, and that schedule has already gone out to everyone who's uh, doing the health and social care course with us. So there are two versions of the course. Uh, there's an older version and there's a new version. So I don't know which version you're doing, but this is something that we can discuss offline, not probably in the session, keeping in mind, uh, you know, it will dissuade from or digress from what we are actually discussing. Okay. I, put I, I, I think we shouldn't be the one that we be testing when are we going to um, do another um, unit. It's not, it's not right. Well, I so can't get into this with you right now, Bukola. Sorry about I, 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 uh, To receive the email together. Yeah, you speak, to, you speak to the college, speak to the college and speak to Jill. I put the number for you and the email on the WhatsApp group. You speak to her and you can get that clarification from her. Because obviously this is for this particular unit is for students who are doing the health and social care course. And this is one of the core units, which is health and social care sector. So there is a different unit. If you're referring to that, you might be in a different course or you have joined the session, uh, you know, maybe somewhere in the middle. That's why probably you've not understood what, what is happening. No worries. Okay. So let's get to the bit that we were discussing. So is have we understood what is CPD, career professional development, and why is it important within the health and social care sector? All right. Now, one of the last assessment criteria that we are looking at covering today is looking at evaluating the structure of a named organization in, in order to uh, you know, crystallize our understanding for what we've studied in learning outcome one. Now, this is a distinction task. It is not a separate task. And what we are looking at is when we talk about you know, organizations which are uh, within the health and social care sector, there are lots of different types of organizations. Can we can we look at if 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 I say what are different organizations working in health and social care sector? Can you think of what organizations are there? Any idea? Any any guesses? Okay, so for okay. example, go on, sorry, go on. Oh, may I thought the organization is me like the, uh, where you belong to that we are working, like my working with like Manchester City Council, that's the organization I'm based on. So some people work with the NHS, so I don't that's know, correct. maybe I'm, I'm right or... Uh, no, no, that's correct, absolutely right, you're spot on. Yeah. So when we talk about organizations, these could be companies, businesses, or if I clarify this rather than non-generically, they would be companies, businesses, or, uh, you know, voluntary, involuntary organizations which are working with the NHS, and you are working within one of those organizations to be able to provide services related to health and social care to the members of public. So when you mentioned local council, when you mentioned, for example, uh, you know, you mentioned a surgery, you mentioned national health service, you mentioned, say, for example, you work even within a regulator's office like CQC, for example, or you work within a hospital, you work within a pharmacy. These are all organizations which are providing some sort of service to the members of public within, uh, within the uh, UK. So here, what we have to do is if you work within a care home, for example, an elderly care home, or you work and provide residential care, or you, you're working as a healthcare worker in a residential care home for the elderly, then this is an organization. So here, the key part is that when I say named organization, what we have to be looking at is an organization which could be a care home, it could be a local authority, you know, any such organization that you have named, like the NHS also, but within the NHS, you work within, say, a hospital or a particular hospital, because when I say NHS is National Health Service, so if I work within Vidinshaw Hospital, or if I work with Greater Manchester Northern Hospital, or if I work with Bupa, which is a private hospital, or if I work with uh, a care room, for example, in Manchester, if I work within, um, say, for example, if I you mentioned local authority, so if I work as a childminder with the Manchester City Council, or if I look at 
uh, I, I look at as a worker who provides foster children's care uh, or foster care to children where, and linked to the Manchester City Council. These are various organizations that you work with. So here the idea is to take a named organization that you're aware of. It could be a GP surgery, it could be a pharmacy, it could be a community you know, health center. It could be, say, for example, um, uh, I would say, say a residential care home. Any place that you work, um, you know, um, in an organization is what you need to take for the purposes of doing this particular, uh, you know, task. Now, this task is not looking at you expand, uh, doing it separately. If you look at task 1.1, it said, explain the overall structure of health and social care sector. Now, within the overall structure that we discussed, which is here. Now, within this structure that we discussed, there are pharmacies. If I expand this part, and if you see it on the slide, it talks about local health care services, which include pharmacies, dentists, opticians. You look at personal helpers, care homes, community groups. You look at online phone services. There are people who deal with people and provide uh, counseling over the phone for mental health care services. You look at GP surgeries, ambulances, hospitals, healthcare centers, and pharmacies. These are all organizations which are within the health and social care sector. Is that okay? So here, yes. taking one of this, one of these organizations that you are familiar with, what we have to look at doing is explain the structure of that particular organization. Is that okay? So here, the structure of that organization, you might explain it in a way wherein you draw a structure uh, with a bit of a flow chart, and then you explain who are the, what are, the, what is the role and responsibilities of some of the people which work within that uh, within that organization, and that would help you cover the distinction criteria. So if I put a slide in, I don't want to take you through theoretically in terms of you know what is the because I've covered the structure of NHS and I've gone through that. But if I just take you theoretically in terms of what you need to do in terms of an organization here would be to look at talking about a particular pharmacy. So if I, in general, at my end, look at a pharmacy like, um, uh, let me show you a site, Parlo, Parlo Medical Center, a surgery, for example that I'm registered with. And if I just show you that on the screen now. So for example, when you look at this particular um, website, this is a website where, you know, it's a surgery essentially, Bala Medical Center, which is on Mimsla Road. And if this is an organization that I'm aware of, what I need to be able to do is look at the structure of this organization. Who are the people who make up this particular organization? So here, some part of this would be available from the website, wherein you would have a structure in terms of who are the people who work within the organization. It could be a combination of, say, for example, GPs, practice manager, clinical nurses, healthcare workers. You will have um, receptionists, you'll have pharmacists, and you know, in general, uh, people who work and provide services on the uh, lab side, for example, for blood tests, for stool tests, for urine tests, things like that. So here is where we get to see that there are lots of different types of people which work within Palo Medical Center. Now, how do I look at drawing up an organization chart of this particular uh, uh, organization? Uh, just to look at, if I go back to the PowerPoint slide now, and what I would do is, for example, if I want to look at Barlow Medical Center, then what I'm going to do is draw up an organizational chart here. And then once I draw up the organizational chart, so if I look at inserting a chart, you can look at here. So this has converted, sorry, my slide into, what I would want to do is insert a new slide here and then use, uh, you know, and create a chart. So here is what I would put a text like Barlow Medical Center. And then here I would say receptionists. 
And then here I'm going to put GPs, nurses, and health care workers, right? This is a broad overview or a structure of that organization. Now, there could be others as well. If I want to insert, say, for example, somebody apart from this under healthcare workers or under GPs, for example, I can do plus and I can do, say, for example, under nurses, also different types of nurses. So there could be, you know, a clinical nurse. You know, if I say a clinical nurse, nurses which are basically allowed, uh, you know, who are capable and uh, able to train, able to, they are trained and capable to basically do or take blood tests, your blood pressure test, you know, any sort of tests which are required to look at your, um, let's say, uh, vital stats. They could do that. GPs, there could be locum GPs, you know, essentially GPs who are, uh, you know, working on the weekends or are essentially doing locum, but they could be GPs who are specialists, uh, you know, in terms of dealing with children or, you know, with uh, vulnerable adults, things like that. In healthcare workers, you could have, you know, health visitors, people who go out and visit uh, people in their homes. There could be healthcare workers, which are essentially you know, looking at providing services, there could be chaperones. And this is what would be the structure of the named organization. And then once I've drawn this structure up, what I could do is you could draw this up in a Word document as well. I can copy this and then I can put this in my, when I do the assignment at a later stage, uh, when, when you're covering this particular task, what you'll be able to do is essentially put this on uh, if I show you my full screen, uh, and what you will be able to do is put this structure onto a Word document, and then here, detail it out in terms of what are the services or what are the roles which essentially are carried out by GPs. You know, you write about nurses, you write about healthcare workers, and, you know, other operational staff you write about, say, practice manager. Social worker. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So you could cover some of these, and that would help you cover task 1D1. So here, because it's a distinction criteria, it is not a theoretical task. It is asking you to talk about a structure, a named structure of the organization that you are aware of. So choose an organization that you have visited, like your surgery, your pharmacy, or the place of your work, if you're working within the health and social care sector, and you would have access to some part of this information, and what you would essentially be able to do then is basically talk about it by creating this structure, and that would help you cover this particular task. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Now, in the slides, I will... Sorry, go on. Any other... Any, somebody was saying I'm something. Not, go on. I'm not saying anything. Yes, ask, uh, if you ask your question again. No, no, no. I didn't say, say is that everything okay? I say yes. I'm just saying right. that. Okay, that's fine. So what I've done in the presentation is there are some slides on which you would essentially see some hyperlinks. Now, this will allow, if you click on some of these links, it will take you to the NHS website or the corresponding website, and it will get you more information that you should read with regards to developing an understanding on some of these key terms and you know acts or key organizations within the structure of the health and social care is that okay yes so that helps us complete today's session now in this presentation what we did was when we looked at the assessment criteria 1.3 it talks about roles and responsibilities of staff now what I put is put a you know link here to the NHS career which is obviously there are 350 roles now, we don't want to cover 350 roles. We want to cover three or four. Now, if you scroll down to the bottom of this slide, just to make the page a bit bigger, if you go towards the end of the presentation, after the references, what I've done is I've put other roles as well. These other roles are roles that are also, you can tick, uh, pick up if you feel that you are more working in a particular role and this would allow you to explain the roles and responsibilities of staff which works within the health and social care or a named organization. So I've chosen, I've put some roles in the initial slides, not to make the session too long. We are already crossed an hour, 10 minutes, 
But if you want to read into some of the other professionals' roles, like psychologists, hospital services, pediatricians, midwives and healthcare visitors, mental health care services, educational services, so people, nurses working within or healthcare workers working within schools, uh, you know, because there's always an on-call nurse or a healthcare visitor uh, or a worker working in most schools if they need to provide first aid or, you know, medication. Then you have people who work within the health and social care setup and are working specifically within school, colleges, universities. Then you look at the members of public who work within public sector services like police, NSPCC, which is a charity or a voluntary organization. So I've, I've talked about a lot of different types of roles that you can also look at studying to increase your knowledge. Uh, if And maybe if this is more related to you, then you can pick up that role and discuss in the assessment criteria 1.3. Is that okay? Good yes, stuff. Sir. Good stuff. So with this, we'll bring an end to today's discussion on the learning outcome one. And I will catch up with you, um, you know, next week, again on Tuesday. And that because okay. next week is Bank Holiday Monday. So it won't be Monday, it'll be Tuesday again and the same time. And we will discuss learning outcome two of this particular unit. This presentation uh, is up on Moodle. I'll quickly show this to you so that most of you who are on the session should have access to this. Uh, and, you know, you should be able to go through the presentation um, in detail and what we've discussed today. Uh, so let me just switch you over. So if you go on to Moodle, and when you're on Moodle, essentially, if you go into health and social care and the course, which is health and social care in bracket old, the older version of the course is four units. That is what you are studying. Um, and in this, if I scroll down and look at the first unit, which is health and social care sector, this unit will, I will turn this into a yellow outline box. So it will be easy to spot. This unit has all the details that we are going to cover. This is the presentation that I've taken you through today in our discussion. So this presentation is completely given here with all the slides and all the details that you see towards the end, the additional roles. So it's the most updated version that I put in here and you should be able to access this presentation uh, and you know go through this uh, in a bit more detail. Now, if you need to look at, obviously there's a recorded lecture which I've done earlier, but if you need to look at today's discussion on the lecture, then you go to the YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash UK virtually online. And under live, you would see this chat, this particular you know session that we are doing is being covered live right now. So once I end the session, you should be able to see this nicely labeled here. As you can see, ATHE level three, diploma in health and social care unit one, health and social care sector, learning outcome one. This is the full recording of the lecture that we have done today. And similarly, for all the lectures that I do, you'll be able to see that uh, when we start our lectures, they'll all be available under the live section and they're all neatly labeled as per the learning outcomes that we're going to cover. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much for attending and uh, for your questions. If you think of any, you can also email us oh, or, you know, sorry, drop text. Yeah, I have something. Yeah, yeah, but the next class, the sent us now is on the 15. Is that correct? Or oh, is the mistake? The next class is on the 9th. Oh, yeah. They haven't sent the link to that. Uh, to us that it's joined on the 15. No, no, it is the, the class is on the 9th. So what I will do is I will mm -hmm. send you the link uh, for the lecture uh, now so that okay. most of you have it. And in any case, what I do is because next Monday is a bank holiday. Yes. So what we're going to do is obviously do the class after the bank holiday, which is on Monday is off. So it will be Tuesday again. Okay. And that would be the link, uh, you know, for the session. So uh, this okay. is the link for the session on 9th May, 2023, 11 a.m. Okay, sir. Is that okay? Yeah. I in case will drop the link every time I start the session, so don't worry about it. But okay. it'll be next week, uh, and that will be, uh, you know, Tuesday. All right, sir. So until then, thank you so much, and take care, and bye for now. Thank you. Bye.